Closed captioning provided by Toyota. Let's go places. Now at six, 20 years after tragedy, the gut-wrenching loss of 9-11 still lingers. We look ahead at how the world has changed as it stops to take pause to honor the innocent lives lost. Good evening, we thank you for joining us. I'm Natalie Pascarella. And I'm Chuck Scarborough. In less than 19 hours, the nation and the world will pause on a day that changed life as we know it 20 years ago, the 9-11 attacks. It was just before 9 a.m. that our city was shaken to the core after the first plane crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. A lot has changed since then. A memorial in Lower Manhattan where the Twin Towers once stood tall honors the innocent lives lost. Long gone are the physical reminders of the attacks but the impact is still woven through American life, an unprecedented expansion of our military, intelligence, and security, creation of the Transportation Security Administration, the Department of Homeland Security, and of course the war in Afghanistan that President Biden ended last month. And the numbers, more people have now died of sickness from 9-11 than those who died on that very day. 2,977 lives lost in three attacks in 2001. And since that day, 4,627 first responders, survivors, heroes have died from complications and illnesses linked to the attacks. This was Chris Glorioso is live in lower Manhattan with the preparations and the security and how people are remembering this solemn day. Chris? Well, Chuck, and of course, that intense security operation well underway right now, partly because some of these 20-year commemorations are well underway. We are live outside St. Paul's Chapel, which of course, as we all know, was such a refuge for those first responders and volunteers working in that recovery effort on the Ground Zero pile at the chapel. There's a choral ceremony here tonight. And then just a little while ago at the memorial, firefighter union staged a wreath laying to honor those heroes who answered their last emergency call by laying down their lives on that clear September morning. One day shy of two decades ago, more than 340 FDNY firefighters were among those murdered at the World Trade Center. Since then, countless Americans have been inspired by their sacrifice. I knew I wanted to serve um, in some capacity, and that could have been as a first responder. At the 9-11 Memorial, Navy Lieutenant Colin Bernard told us people keep coming up to him, thanking him for his service. Appreciation for military and first responders is a legacy of the 9-11 attacks, and first responders are working overtime to protect this sacred ground 20 years later. There are no specific and credible threats directed against New York City at this time. And the NYPD is watching, not daily, not hourly, minute by minute. Friday evening, visible and invisible security measures being taken all around Lower Manhattan, all so people like pilot Bill Fallon can reflect with dignity on lost friends like Charles Chick Burlingame. You just remember a guy whose name is Chick, so, uh, and, he was, and he was a great guy. Chick Burlingame was the pilot of hijacked flight 77, which crashed into the Pentagon. The Trentini family from Massachusetts came here to commemorate James and Mary, two retirees who died sitting next to each other on board hijacked flight 11, which crashed into the North Tower. I don't know if they would still be alive now. They could be. They were both you know, 65 and 67, but um, we sure wish they were. James and Mary Trentini were on flight 11 flying that morning to see their grandkids in California. So it is only fitting that tomorrow their granddaughter is scheduled to read their names at the commemoration. For now, reporting live in Lower Manhattan, Chris Glorioso, News 4 New York. Oh, Chris, we thank you for that. 20 years ago, United Flight 93 took off from Newark Airport, crashing into a field in Pennsylvania. And today, the airport dedicated a new memorial with steel from the World Trade Center. A 20,000-pound piece of a steel column from the corner of the South Tower sat in a warehouse for years. It now honors those lost in that new memorial designed by Jason Del Nero. That steel from Ground Zero was placed on top of a piece of black granite with a memorial plaque. Uh, it just took some time to get the right spot, to get the right piece, to get the right design and implementation done, and just happened to coincide now with the 20th anniversary, which I think is fitting. And the wreaths were also laid to honor those who died 
including the Port Authority officers killed in the attacks. A long line of boats floated past the battery to mark a rarely remembered act of heroism. It marks the greatest water evacuation of people in history. Tugs, ferries, and party boats were used to evacuate approximately a, a half a million people from Manhattan after the attacks. The ceremony honors brave captains and recognizes a moment when saving lives meant more than just following the rules. There is a capacity limit, but at the time, in the moment, it seemed more importantly to get more people off of the city. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes rules have to be broken. Needless to say, a lot of rules were broken that day. Boat after boat pulled up to the docks in Jersey City, Staten Island, and Brooklyn, with office workers and Manhattan residents trying to escape the chaos, Chuck. Of the thousands of the lives lost, hundreds were New York's bravest and finest. 2,700 people were killed at the World Trade Center. 343 members of the FDNY, 23 NYPD officers, and 37 members of the Port Authority Police. In Westchester, a new memorial was unveiled to mark 20 years since the attacks. Families of 9-11 first responders gathered at Valhalla near the Kensington Dam to remember those lost. 41 names are etched in two granite stones with an eternal light that stands across the entrance to the rising memorial. There will be room for up to eight memorial stones as the number of those dying of 9-11 related illnesses grows. He went down there, spent time digging and you know, on the pile and this is, he loved being an EMT and the fact that he's being honored this way it's not just for us, it's also for him. And this project was spearheaded by Westchester County and a committee co-chaired by a retired police officer. Tomorrow, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President George W. Bush will visit the Flight 93 Memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The names of passengers will be read at 10.03 when Flight 93 crashed into a field after being hijacked. Passengers fought back to prevent it from crashing in Washington. All 44 people on board died. In Washington, D.C., a tribute of light will shine bright again this evening above the Department of Defense headquarters through early Sunday morning. It's to honor the 189 people killed at the Pentagon when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into it. An FDNY firefighter is swimming around Manhattan for a good cause 20 years later. Andrew Kane's family and friends cheered him on as he jumped into the Hudson this morning. A few years after 11, he volunteered with the FDNY counseling unit to help his fellow firefighters deal with the stress of the job. Today's swim is to raise awareness that firefighters and first responders all need help and that it's okay to reach out. We think of firefighters as, you know, strong and, you know, they're running in when everybody's running out. And the truth is it doesn't make them any less strong, any less of a person, um, man or woman, um, to seek help. And, of course, we've been tracking Andrew. He is almost finished with that swim around Manhattan. He says swimming the nearly 30 miles is not just about mental health awareness, but also about honoring the 343 firefighters who were lost on 9-11. And we will be sharing the stories of victims, survivors, first responders, and their families leading up to the September 11th ceremony 20 years later. We invite you to join us for our live coverage tomorrow starting at 6 a.m. on air, online, and on the NBC4 New York app. We have other news to get to at this hour. Breaking news just coming in of a hospital fire in Queens. Citizen video shows flames, and you also see large plumes of dark smoke coming from the roof of St. John's Hospital. This is in Far Rockaway. We don't exactly know how it started yet. We're working to gather more information for you, but we'll have any new information in this newscast and also on News 4 at 7 coming up. All right, and up next as we continue for you, other top stories, remembering the power outage that shut down the subways last month. We now have a cause, and you might not believe it. And a wild crime spree. Investigation into Brooklyn. You know, an explosion goes off at an apartment in Brooklyn when a man on a dirt bike smashes windshields. The search for him. And lots of sunshine as we head into and through the weekend and even a little taste of fall as we roll through the overnight. We'll have your full forecast coming up in just a few minutes. 
Uh, do you remember that power outage? It shut down half the subway system last month. All of the numbered lines went off the grid. Hundreds rescued from powerless trains. Well, now we have a cause. An investigation found that it was caused by human error. A simple singular switch was flipped that crippled the underground. News for us, Adam Harding is live in Long Island City with how something like this could happen. Adam? And Chuck, the reason, according to investigators, apparently there was some type of plastic guard that is normally over the button that would prevent anyone from accidentally pressing it. And in this case, they say that plastic cover was not there. It was quite the admission Friday from the MTA after investigators confirmed last month's subway power outage that stranded passengers wasn't due to a power surge as first believed. Turns out they say it was human error. I am deeply disappointed in this and I say to our customers this cannot happen. Who could forget all those who had to be evacuated after the L and all numbered train shut down on August 29th. People were getting anxious and this claustrophobic is yeah, really yeah. hot in there, it's tight. So what exactly caused the panic and confusion? It appears that a button was pushed accidentally um, that was not supposed to be pushed. Yes, a button, a switch in the control center, likely all in accident, as investigators say it was missing the plastic cover designed to keep it from getting pressed. We can't have people who are confused or not perfectly trained for the emergency doing things that are actually mistakes that make the emergency worse. If it's so easily accessible, like that's just not a very good design. The governor tonight calling for an operations review. Come on guys, one switch, really? As riders rail against the subway, the MTA is promising they'll get back on track. To our customers, we make the pledge, we're going to fix this and we're going to do it fast. Tonight, the governor is saying that New Yorkers deserve confidence in the subway. They say it is their job to restore that confidence immediately. Well, that's tonight in Queens, Long Island City. I'm Adam Harding, News 4, New York. All right, Adam, thank you. In Brooklyn, the police are looking for a man who set off an explosive device inside a Bed-Stuy apartment building this morning. Officers say it was probably a large firework, but it did cause some extensive damage. Prosecutors say he may have been targeting a woman and child inside one of the apartments. Family members of his say, no, and he says no one was hurt uh, while riding away on a dirt bike, though. The police say he smashed into the windshields of 14 cars parked along Madison Street. All right, still to come tonight at 6, going beyond the name on the 9-11 memorial. There's not been a chapter of my life that I have gone through that I haven't thought that I'm doing it and she didn't get to do it. A sister, a daughter, childhood friend and neighbor. The personal connection to a young woman killed on 9-11 and the frustrations that remain for her family 20 years later. Lester Holtz also here at Ground Zero with us, and he joins us now with a look at tonight's special edition of Nightly News. Chuck, uh, good, good to have you. Good to see you here. Uh, tonight we're going to be exploring the voices, some of the sounds, and the oral record of the history in a special edition of Nightly News. We're also going to look at changes in security and how that has evolved over the last two decades when we see you tonight on Nightly News. All right, Lester, thank you. We will see you real soon. We want to get over to Storm Team 4's Dave Price to get a, a check of the weather. It's a little breezy from where we are, Dave. All right, Natalie, it is going to be a pleasant evening, though, as we head on into the rest of the night. 73 degrees is where we're going to start with a west-northwest wind at about 9 miles per hour. We could see some breezes higher than that uh, down in the southern tip of Manhattan where you are. Dew points at 45. That's dry air, so beautiful as we head into and through the weekend. Rough surf, if you're going to the coastline this weekend, please watch because the rip currents are going to be dangerous because of Larry, Hurricane Larry, in the Atlantic. Warm weather comes our way, and as we head into next week we're going to be in the upper 80s at uh, at some point we'll talk about the timing in just a moment 72 in Poughkeepsie right now 73 in Islip 72 in Clinton and 72 in Belmar radar and satellite shows clear skies that's what we're going to enjoy over the next 48 hours high pressure is rolling on through and as it does eventually it's going to spin up some warmer air coming in our direction and that's when the temperature starts to climb dew points as well as we head into Sunday up to about 61 and then getting sticky into 
into Monday and Tuesday just as the thermometer begins to really peak. Uh, the getaway forecast looks great both days for uh, places up north, Woodstock Beacon and Bear Mountain. And if you're going to the beach, Sunday the warmer day. But keep in mind, water conditions dangerous. Watch for a high risk of rip currents along the south facing shores of the city and the island and down to the Jersey Shore as well. Don't forget, still plenty of hurricane season left, although we seem to be at the pinnacle, uh, historically speaking. Next chance of rain as we head into Wednesday, thunder showers could see some residual showers as we head into Thursday. That's a quick look at the weather picture, a quiet pattern over the next several days. Back to you. All right, Dave, thank you. All this week, News 4 has been going beyond the names at the memorial here in Lower Manhattan. Nearly 3,000 described here. One is very close to my family, Catherine Fairfax McRae. Cat McRae, to those who knew and loved her. Cat was a neighbor, a childhood friend of both my children. We mourned all who were lost that day, but our hearts especially ached for Cat. She was 23, beginning the next chapter in a life already filled with accomplishment. By all accounts, Cat was a superb student, athlete, and friend. Editor of her high school newspaper, team co-captain in three sports, Princeton Honors graduate. She'd just begun a new job with Fred Alger Management at One World Trade Center. In a single moment of unspeakable cruelty and horror, Kat was gone. And a family of four became a family of three, clinging to their memories and struggling with their loss, even at a distance of 20 years. The shock of it, I mean, the horror of what happened took years for me to accept. You raised her as well as any parents could. You protected her from everything, mm -hmm. all harm, but you could not protect her from an ideology that celebrated the murder of innocence, mm -mm. that glorified it. And we think about that a lot. I mean, my friends would have said, oh, you're so overly protective. And there she was, murdered in downtown Manhattan, not on a trip on some Botswana river or something. It was right there in our backyard. Here we are uh, 20 years later dealing with uh, terrorists in exactly the same country. We're right back where we started. For Kat's father, Grief is equal parts loss and anger. Anger that the government didn't stop the attack. Anger that files on Saudi Arabia's potential involvement in the plot are still being kept secret. It's frankly just repulsive. And uh, to continue to let this ideology exist in the world. You know, there's not been a chapter of my life that I have gone through that I haven't thought that I'm doing it and she didn't get to do it. Annie McRae was 19 when her big sister was killed. Married now with three boys. A memory so vivid, so indelible, it almost seems Kat is still right there. I hear her voice, I do hear, like everything I do, I do think, you know, would my sister be proud of this? I feel her and um, who she is saying, Annie, you really shouldn't do that, you really shouldn't say that, <laughs> like being critical of her little sister. I think about her all the time, I would say, as I carry through my life and make sure that she would still approve. Shortly after Kat was killed, the family established the Kat McRae Fund to honor her legacy of academic excellence. The fund supports programs for inner city children from low income communities. There are now two Kat McRae libraries in city schools and support for Harlem Academy, a place where Kat's mother finds purpose that helps ease her grief, teaching art history. Artists make him look strong. He looks strong because, because of the nails that he has in his body. Through these kids, there was a connection to Cat for me. Cat had so many opportunities, and he did. I want these children to have those same advantages. And at home, there was always a door open to life while Cat was alive. Their pictures. I have now lived longer without Kat than with her. But you look at the pictures and she's like right here. Kat and I are playing in a pile of leaves in the backyard, but we're just playing and we're wearing matching sweaters, which is quite so sweet. She's looking at a puppet show here on her third birthday. Such concentration. That was a, a birthday party on a boat. This is our Christmas card with our dog, Charlie. You can see how she had progressed from a beautiful young girl to a slightly older, but still 
extraordinarily beautiful. We had a um, photographer come the summer of 1995 to take family pictures and little did I know I'm so glad we took them yeah this is uh, at her 21st birthday she was a captivating child and I would say she remained that way all her life it, it's just a, f a flow of, of marvelous memories with Kat and you know when there are no more photos to take you hang on desperately and dearly to the ones you have. <laughs>